Welcome to the seventh tutorial. We will create four new trees today. The main focus will be on synchronization, but I will also introduce some other unrelated concepts. First, we will use the remaining nodes from the synchronization class. We already used semaphore, so today we will look at synchronize and external lock. Second major part will focus on the event-driven node called area presence and uh, we will use it for reactions to people entering and leaving an area. We will also tap into the standard MPC brain. So the synchronization part will have these two MPCs do something in sync. The MPCs are inside this uh, blue area and they will react to different people being inside or outside, which will interfere with their attempts at synchronized behavior. This NPC will react to this guy, while this man will be reacting to the player. These two NPCs are called Wave NPCs. I call this one Wave Master, and the other one is Wave Slave. Uh, for lack of better words, uh, they don't employ any sort of uh, master-slave control structure. They are actually uh, quite equal. It's just that the master is in control of one specific part of the behavior logic. When the wave NPCs are in their normal mode, they go to these two points. And in a loop, they will keep attempting to synchronize. And when that happens, they will both play a waving animation at the same time. There is a third NPC called Stalker, again for lack of any better term. His only goal will be to be going in a loop between these two points and wait there for random amounts of time. The important part is that he will be randomly crossing the blue area where these two are situated. The wave NPCs each have a second point called height position. When the stalker enters the area, the master will switch to hiding mode, uh, which will get him to the hiding spot and he will stay there until the stalker leaves the area. The slave uh, will react the same, but he will be reacting to the player entering and leaving the area. This whole thing means that the wave NPCs will be playing the wave animation only when there's no one else inside. And when the player or the stalker will be inside, one of the wave NPCs will remain at the waving position, but they must not play the animation. Let's inspect the level setup. There is this uh, blue area of type trigger area. You can find it here under AI Warhorse trigger area. And I've also set uh, this property to true for better visibility of uh, the area. What is the difference between trigger areas and smart areas? Smart areas are not just entities, but smart entities, which means that they can have a brain assigned and they can execute some AI trees. But smart areas must also follow uh, a very strict spatial hierarchy. In other words, they must not overlap. I've created this invalid setup here for demonstration. As you can see, uh, there are these two nested areas, and they are both intersected by the third area here. You can check the validity of this setup in the XGen editor. So this checker is saying that there are two errors, which is true. That there is this intersection and this overlap. Now when I delete the third area, we can check the setup again. Now it's okay. You can also visualize the hierarchy here. Trigger areas, as I mentioned, are entities which means that they have their own entity definition with a Lua file that's, that's here. 
and you can link them with AI links and the reference to them can be stored in any variable of type common width. Since they are not smart entities, they cannot execute any tree. But, and it's a big but, you can place them wherever you like and they can intersect with anything in any way. So you can create a setup like this and it will work just fine. They are also sometimes called dumb areas. Tricky areas are used for several different purposes, mainly as spatial volume defining triggers where you react to entities being inside or outside or getting in and out. They may also serve as uh, lightweight substitutes for smart areas in some special cases and they are also frequently used for defining quest area markers, but more on that later. The smart area has two new links. One is nameless and goes to the trigger area. And the second one is called stalker and it goes to the stalker NPC. The stalker NPC has something special about him. He doesn't use the same brain that is used by all these other NPCs in the level. Instead he uses the standard brain used by most NPCs in the actual game. The brain is called NPC underscore Daycycle and it looks like this. We could spend hours inspecting this brain, so consider this a quick introduction. The NPC Daycycle features several subbrains. You can see them here. The switch subbrain is a very wide brain with several parallel included trees. It's running all the time and it handles the switching between the other subbrains. It also governs some systems which run all the time on every individual, like perception, awareness, crime, hit reactions, and so on. These two subbrains are reserved for dialogue and combat, as their names suggest. The situation subbrain is reserved for what we call situation system, which is responsible for short, random, interruption-like interactions between NPCs as they go about their uh, daily chores. Typically, somebody goes to the shop and they meet someone available for a particular situation. So they have a short dialogue exchange on the street and then they continue to the shop. That's a situation. The main subbrain is also running by default and it controls what is called daycycle activities or daycycle schedule and behavior patches. Each soul has a set of daycycle activities schedule defined in the database in the soul table. You can set this data up either directly in the database or by creating a rule in the tool called storm which is well documented on the modding wiki. NPC schedule looks like this. Just select an NPC and use the script toolbar. This is a 24 hour plan. The time is represented by this yellow line here. When the game runs, it goes from left to right. And each time it runs through an edge like this one, it will look up the activity and attempt to run it. This guy's soul in particular has default settings, so he has the activity dummy weight, followed by second to dummy weight at 5.30 a.m. So he does nothing, but he does it twice a day. All day cycle activities have baseline priority zero. That's this line. If you want to temporarily override the day cycle schedule, you must use something called a patch. Here is a screenshot of an actual day cycle with a patch from the game. This is a day cycle of NPC called Kunesh, more specifically his technical twin in the city of Ratai. He's got the base day cycle where he sleeps until almost 8.30 and then he works until 22.29 where he goes to sleep again. The time is currently some 11 hours. 
At that time, the D cycle is patched over by this behavior called uh, Kunesh init lean from 7 a.m. for the next 15 hours. So the time goes like this. Then the AI engine finds here at this edge that there's a higher priority behavior. You can see the value 40 here. So it tells the MPC to start executing it. Patches can be removed, which results in the MPC eventually returning to its basic day cycle schedule. Patches are typically used for any quest related behaviors. We will take a deeper dive into this part of the brain uh, in some later tutorial. The main subbrain also features handling of death, changing clothes, self curing, uh, or a system called Dudeprox, which is responsible for the famous greeting Hey, Henry has come to see us. Yeah, so Jesus Christ be praised. To work properly, the MPC cycle brain requires a fully realized level, which we don't have here. So you can't use it simply out of the box here, as it would start failing. You can prevent its failure, however, by forcing it to execute a specific behavior. A normal behavior, uh, be it the schedule activity or a patch behavior, would normally be included in runtime under this call behavior node. The override system named upcall does not include the behaviors here. It will include the behavior under uh, this call behavior up here. Upcall is used for quick tests and development using some actual game NPCs without having to resort to some hacks in the brain or the level. Upcall is set up in this way. You link the source of the behavior, that's the smart area in our case, using a link named call. Then in the uh, MPC entities properties, way, way down here, you have to check the option upcall enable. And then you have to write in the name of the behavior here. And that's it. So when we jump in, the MPC will attempt to run the behavior stalker from this area. And you will see its execution here. Since we are ready to utilize the standard MPC daycycle brain with the stalker MPC, uh, we might as well use some predefined soul. Click connect to existing soul and take um, Aus Baker, for example. That's the Baker MPC from Ujits. The entity loads up all his settings and when I reload uh, the AI scripts, we can see his day cycle schedule. He sleeps, works and sleeps. His up call is still set up the same way, so he should work just fine. One more thing you have to pay attention to when using NPCs with the standard brain is that they are fully interactive, feature complete and fully aware of their surroundings. When I jump near, I don't know, uh, these guys, they are far enough and try to punch them They will play the heat reaction animations, but they will ignore me. This guy doesn't care that his pal is under a vicious attack. When I try to, uh, you can press F3 to fly. Uh, when I try to punch the baker, he will react properly. Okay, so he is running away. He's probably fleeing from combat due uh, to low carriage, or he is trying to find a guard to report uh, the crime to. And there is none, so we are getting this beautiful red spam in the console. Ha! Huh. 
now he even teleported you uh, to some failed move. That's also a thing you can get. Anyway, uh, he would also react to me trying to pickpocket or attack someone else. Generally, uh, any crime committed on anyone. To prevent all these failures, I will actually set the stalker to Hans Capen, uh, who is set uh, to a full VIP status, which means you cannot commit any crime against him. And his faction is Dude Best Friends, which means that he doesn't report players' mayhem. You may be wondering uh, what his day cycle looks like. Just reload the AI scripts and uh, it will update. Behold, it's finally something more complicated. Sleep, morning activity, uh, then some work, eat, work some more, and sleep. So this was a bit long-winded, yet still horribly insufficient introduction to the standard brain. Let's finish uh, checking the level setup and the actual trees. The Stalker Hans has these two points linked. And he upcalls the behavior Stalker from this area. Uh, the behavior looks like this. It features one indexed array and an integer for iterating through the array. We find both points by using the entity class filter with class tag point and store them in the array. Then we execute an endless loop. There we play a looped animation looking round and we terminate it after random time between 3 and 8 seconds. 3 seconds is the minimum, and the maximum time is 3 plus 5 equals 8. Then we move to whichever is the next point, then we iterate, uh, and then we check if we haven't got out of uh, the array bounds, and eventually reset the iterator i back to zero. That's uh, the default value. And repeat. So Stalker Hans really goes from here to there and uh, he waits at each stop. You might have noticed there is zero support for safe and load. Same as last time, Safe load is not uh, the focus here. The implementation of it inevitably leads to trees uh, which are worse readable, and I didn't want to complicate the tutorial too much. So, none of the trees you will see today are safe load proof, but I encourage you to try to implement the safe load support yourself once all the parts are running flawlessly without it. That's actually how you would typically uh, develop your code. The trees are not too complicated, so it shouldn't pose any uh, significant challenge for you. And now uh, you wave NPCs. They use the old brain. The wave master has a work link to the area, and as you can see, he calls the behavior wave master. He also has these two points linked with wave position and height position. Same applies to the other NPC, only the slave calls the wave slave behavior and he has a different set of points linked. The wave master behavior is defined like this. We find the two tech points, then under this parallel node we have some control structure I will explain later. And there's the execution part, which starts with a very familiar system. We have two modes, wave and hide, and they are preceded by continuous switch. 
The default value of mode is wave, so the MPC starts there. The height mode is extremely simple. The MPC simply goes to height position stored in test height and waits there indefinitely until the mode changes to wave. The wave mode is also nothing complicated. We go to wave point, only instead of move we use exact move, which is an alternative node where you can demand that the MPC ends up at the exact position where you are sending him. That is not guaranteed by simple move, which prioritizes smooth looking movement over precision. Simply set precise to true and the magic is done. And you can also align the MPC with some entity. So we go to the test wave position. Uh, we go to it precisely. So the MPC ends up here. And then we also align the MPC with the rotation of this point, so he will be facing in this direction. Then there is this loop. Let's check it out in uh, reverse order. We simply play the waving animation, uh, wait for its end, because it's a one-shot animation. And then the loop repeats and uh, we wait for 3 to 6 seconds for another attempt at waving. As you can see, the play animation part is preceded by this synchronized node. You are already familiar with Semaphore. You can notice that they look similar. That's because they come from the same group of nodes. They use the same lock name, lock manage type and lock count system but they behave very differently. Semaphore, if you still remember it, doesn't allow anybody above the lock count limit to execute the child tree, and anybody over limit must wait until a quote unquote slot is freed up. So Semaphore prevents too many participants from executing a part of the script. It's a limiter. The synchronized node creates an exact requirement for the number of participants that must execute the child tree simultaneously. What they are forced to do is they wait at the synchronized node and are counted towards the lock count requirement. When the requirement is eventually met, then all of those uh, waiting participants will start executing the child tree at the same time. In practical terms, when we have this lock count set to 2, this is what will happen. The first participant gets here, and since the requirement is 2, he will wait here. Later, another participant arrives at an identically set up synchronized node in the same lock manager scope, somewhere in history. There's now two of them, which means the requirement so they will then both start executing the child trees at the same time. Question is, what happens when a third participant arrives, when the first two are still executing the child tree and are still somewhere, somewhere here? Such latecomer would also have to wait. How long? Well, this is governed by the outside timer. It's minus one, so he will wait forever. But if you get here first and nobody is currently being synchronized, that applies to the first participant, then you will be waiting as defined by the inside timer. So the first participant waits for this endless time. When the second participant arrives, they both become synchronized, so he doesn't wait for anything. They start executing the child trees. If a third participant comes here, he waits for this infinite time until they finish the child trees. Then he will switch to the inside timer and he will be the first in line for the next synchronization. So as you can see, the synchronized node really ensures and enforces synchronization. The WaveMaster is also in control of delays between repetitions of this loop. 
That's the only reason why I call him master. The last part of the log based nodes is uh, the external logs system. And it comes in the pair of nodes called external log and set external log. External log is uh, also based on a log name and log manager type, but it doesn't feature any log count as you can see. It's not, strictly speaking, a gate type node, but it behaves like one. It opens when its log manager, as defined by a name and scope, is set to unlocked state. The external lock is locked by default, and this state is non-persistent, which means that it doesn't carry over if you save and load. The lock would be closed again. You can have several instances of the same external lock nodes, like here in this tree, or in several different trees and brains. And if they are properly set up using the name and the scope, then uh, when unlocked, they will open at the same time and will permit execution of their chart trees. This means that external locks can also be used for a kind of synchronization. But unlike synchronize, they permit latecomers to also execute the child tree. The external locks, as the name suggests, are set to locked or unlocked state uh, by the node set external lock, where you specify the lock name, the scope, and the state. Locked false is, of course, unlock. Locked true means lock it. As a result, external locks are used for sending simple binary signals and for quasi-synchronization. And this is exactly what we are using in the parallel control part. In the parallel we have a loop and here we have an external lock called stalker entered. And it is locked by default so the execution waits here. Some uh, other tree I will show you later is observing if the stalker physically entered the area. If so, it will unlock this external lock. So it will open and in this chart tree we change the mode to hide and then we immediately lock the same external lock and uh, we loop it so we are immediately ready to react again. The lock uh, is set to scope local which means uh, that it will listen to lock unlock signals from within this behavior or from uh, the behavior source, that's the smart area, or uh, from within any instance of any behavior defined on that source. So uh, master and slave could unlock each other's uh, locks, but uh, we actually don't do that. Likewise, if uh, the stalker observing tree detects that the stalker has left the area, it will open the other lock named uh, stalker left, which uh, will switch the mode back to wave, and then uh, again we lock it and loop it. The wave slave behavior is nearly identical. We also find the wave position the height position, we also use the external lock driven uh, control logic, only uh, the locks in this behavior are named player entered and player left. And this is also reflected here. The names are different because uh, the slave reacts to player driven signals. The behavior also has two modes, wave and hide. The hide mode is the same. He goes to the position and waits there. In the wave mode, we have an identical exact move and you can find the other synchronized node here. He also plays the same animation. The slave's wave mode lacks any delay control, which is done by the master. So as soon as uh, the slave is done moving to the wave point. 
or is done playing the animation, he is uh, ready for another synchronization. So in most scenarios, he would be the first participant. But when the master is here, and the slave is uh, here in hiding and he's returning, then it's the master who is the first synchronization participant. So that's three uh, trees out of four. The last one is the observer of the trigger area and it is implemented in the onUpdate tree of the smart area. Here we find the trigger area and store it. Then we find the stalker and store him in an indexed array watch NPCs. Uh, we need an array because we will be observing a group of entities entering and leaving the area. The next step is that we push back the reference to player to the array. So uh, stalker will be on the first index and player will be uh, the second item in the array. And uh, then uh, we use the area presence node. Area presence is an event driven node. You define an area, a list of bits, typically NPCs that uh, you want to track and then uh, you define uh, the events you want to track, the NPCs entering and slash or leaving uh, the area. The observed area can be either smart area or trigger area. So uh, here we are tracking the watch NPCs array containing uh, stalker and player. And we watch the trigger area. We want to track both events, so we have track in and track out set to true. And since we also want to track these events uh, perpetually, the option once is set to false. This means that the node will never end on its own, just like continuous switch, for example, unless it's halted from above, which will not happen in this setup. If the once parameter were set to true, uh, the node would only track the first event that occurs and then it would succeed, which would turn the node into sort of a gate type node. That's a very important distinction. When an event occurs, the node can fill these two variables out MPC and out event with corresponding data. The variable in the out event parameter must be a boolean. The true value means that somebody entered and the false value means that somebody left the area. The variable inserted in the out MPC parameter will be filled with the width of uh, the entity that fired this event. So it must be a single common width variable. We don't use the report initial state, but it can be used for extra processing or filtering out of uh, initial state of the watched entities. Whenever an event occurs, uh, the child tree of this node is executed. Uh, the node keeps its own buffer of these events as uh, they occurred in time, so you don't have to worry about uh, missing out on an event when the previous one is being processed. In the child tree, we simply ask if the event MPC, the one who caused the event, is the player. If so, we then ask if the event is true, that is, if the player entered. Then we unlock the player entered or player left external locks in the wave slave's behavior. If it's not the player, uh, then it must be the other guy from the array, the stalker. And again, we ask about the event and we unlock either stalker entered or stalker left, which will cause reaction in the wave master's behavior. So what happens when the stalker enters the area? It would go like this. An event would be forced, so this child tree will be executed. Is it the player? No, so it goes here. Is the event true? Yes. So we unlock the stalker entered. This will cause that in the wave master behavior, this external lock will open. 
Subsequently, the mode will be changed to hide and the lock will be immediately locked. Presumably, uh, this tree was being executed. The continue switch will react to the change in mode and it would try to open this part. As a result, this tree will fail, the fail will be consumed by the switch, and the master will go to hiding. There's one more thing I have to mention. Ideally, we should have the area presence node set to atomic, uh, so that the child tree is executed atomically. But there is a known unfixed bug which causes uh, a crash if you attempt to use breakpoints like this in atomic area presence. So for the purpose of testing, I'm leaving it as non-atomic. And that's it. Let's finally run the tests. Let's jump in. I will use this CVAR uh, WHAI trigger areas debug draw set to 1 so that we can see uh, the trigger area in blue in the game mode. The NPCs should now start waving synchronously. Now the stalker Hans is uh, about to enter, so Master should go to hiding. Yep. Now he's returning as Hans left. And only now uh, they can start waving again. And now when I enter two, they are both hiding. The master should uh, return uh, and he cannot wave. And when I leave, they can return to waving again. Good. So you've learned how to synchronize stuff and then some. Congrats and see you next time.